Well, Pastor John Rickner of Northwoods Community Church in my hometown is going to give a message on marriage. And I got the email and I thought, oh man, I got to listen to this because Northwoods Community Church is the largest church in my area. I mean, this is the church where things are happening. I mean, this is a huge church, awesome church, awesome programs. They got the fog machines. They got the people playing guitar, dancing around. I mean, just like amazing stuff going on at this church. It's where all the movers and shakers go. So I should probably be going to this church. But Pastor John of the church, who's a good guy. I like this pastor. Good pastor. He's going to speak on marriage. And I thought, man, how on earth is this guy going to speak on Ephesians 5 to the women of his church who are Modern women, most probably, I don't know, 80% of his church women are working outside the home block. This is not some traditional church where the women show up in long dresses and head coverings or something. This is like the, probably the opposite of that. So he's going to speak on that. And I thought, man, I got to tune in. So here we go. Now, if you're liking this content, like, subscribe, and give me a comment below. This is good stuff. We'll get it rocking here. Now, Pastor John has set up the message here, making the first point about thriving in marriage and how you need to be together, how it shouldn't be about the kids or your job, but you need to make marriage number one, number two priority. There's God and then your marriage, and then the kids and then the job, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Hey, that's good advice. I like that. Good advice. Now we're going to get into the roles of marriage. All right. Woo, boy. Now it's getting tough. Here we go. Okay, but then Paul goes on to give us another instruction. Here's number two. Embrace your God-given role. Embrace your God-given role. Now, for those of you who were here with us back in April and part of May, we did a series called You Asked For It. And this is a series I've done two times now where you submit questions and then you vote on those questions. And the top five questions, the top five most vote-getting questions, I end up preaching on. It's always a very uh, tense time for me because I'm like, what am I going to have to preach on? And one of those questions that you submitted this year was, what is the role of women in the church and the home? And if you remember, back in April, I said I was going to divide that question. I said, I'll talk about what is the role of women in the church. It's a big enough subject. And I said, later in the year, I'd come back to you, what is the role of women in the home? I'm going to touch on that here, okay? Oh, you got to love that. I love this guy. I love this pastor. You got to love that. Oh, oh, man. He knows. He knows. You talk about the role of women. It better be anything you know what the role of a woman is anything anything she wants it to be that's what her role is right he knows it he's got a oh man cross my heart hope to die stick a needle in my eye whoa he knows what's coming now just to set to set the scene here let me set the biblical scene for the role of a woman you remember contingy brown jackson our supreme court justice she said they asked her what is a woman maybe we should just start with what is a woman not what's the role of woman, but what is a woman? She said, I don't know. I can't define that. I'm not a biology. Let me define it from scripture. Let me define it from scripture. You know what a woman is? Genesis chapter two says the woman is the helper to the man. That's what she is. She's the helper to the man. That's a pretty good definition, isn't it? So what would that have to do with her role? Well, about everything. Is she helping her man? That's her role, right? That's who God created her to be in Genesis chapter two. Paul reiterates that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He says, For the man was not created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Woman was created for the man. That's who she is. Okay, this is who she is. So when we talk about a role, we should root it in Genesis and even in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians. It's rooted in these things. All right, here we go. Pastor John, he knows <clears throat> it's going to be trouble. Okay, so let's jump in starting in verse... 21. The Apostle Paul says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So he starts with his thought of submitting to one another. But now he's going to unpack what that looks like in a relationship. Because we both do it, but we both do it through embracing different roles, or we might say kind of attitudes of the heart or postures. He starts with the wives. Ephesians 5.22. He says wives. And I'm just going to stop here. Okay, let's just highlight this word right here, wives. Why don't you pay attention to the very first word. Who is he addressing this section of scripture to? Wives. In other words, he did not address this to husbands to make sure husbands enforce this scripture with their wives. If he wanted to do that, he would have said husbands 
and gone on and said, make sure your wives submit to you. Didn't say that. He said, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. So men, husbands, this is not our job to enforce this with our wives. This is your wife's verse. So you stay out of it. It's for her. All right. Now, did you notice that? Did you know? Now, I've heard pastors say this must be a common, more of a common cliche when we get to this verse, because I keep hearing this more and more from pastors. I think the first pastor I heard say this was J.D. Greer, who's what, North Carolina? He's a large church, North Carolina, Southern Baptist. He was the Southern Baptist Convention like president or whatever for a while. J.D. Greer. But I, I'm sure he probably wasn't the first one to coin it. But this helps this helps wives submitting to be a little more palatable because we can say, hey, listen, this is addressed to wives. So husbands, you better not ever tell your wives that they need to submit to you. Now, at least he doesn't go so far as like Mike Winger, who says that if a man, if a husband tells his wife to submit to him, that's abuse. I mean, that that's in a different cat. That's like, dude, man, you you are out in left field. If you think if a husband tells his wife to submit to him, that's abuse. Come on. I mean, no, but this this is wrong. OK, this is not correct teaching to say that husbands should not tell their wives to submit to them like that. That's incorrect. Incorrect. Just write in Ephesians chapter five. It would be incorrect. If you read on in here, what's the husband supposed to do? It says husbands love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or blemish, holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives, meaning you should wash your wife with the water of the word to cleanse her. So if she is not submitting to her you, she is disobeying the commands of God, and she needs to be washed with the word of God. And one of the commands that will wash her is for her to submit to you in your marriage. I mean, there's only about three things a woman is commanded to do in scripture in regard to her husband. She's to submit, she's to respect, she's to reverence her husband. There's only about three. That's about it. All right. I mean, there's other stuff in there, but that's, that's about it. Like those three things are the main things that should be taught over and over and over and over again, not just by the pastors, but as Titus 2 says, by the older women should be teaching this to the younger women. I'm getting off on a tangent. Let's go on here. And one more thing, though. He also says that, well, the Bible doesn't say, husbands, you're to make your wives submit, blah, blah, blah. Well, that's, that's because you cannot make someone submit. You can make them comply. If you give a command, you can make them comply, but you cannot make someone submit. That's an act of the will. You can't do that. It says, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, which he is the Savior. And then he says, now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Now, if I were to do a series titled The Most Unpopular Verses in the Bible, this one would probably make the cut. In fact, as I'm reading it, I can, it just feels like there's tension rising in the room. Many Christians cringe. Oh, you know there's tension rising in that room. They're cringing. The women are just biting on their nails. How dare you read the word of God to us and the command for us to submit in everything. What does this mean, Pastor John? What what does it mean to submit in everything? Boy, that I mean, that's pretty... That's pretty conclusive. Let's pack. Let's unpack that. What does it mean to submit in everything? It's when they hear that passage. And it's often because submit is seen as a dirty word, especially when it comes to marriage. Because we think of all the, the tyrants and power-hungry men who have used this passage to abuse and subjugate women. So some react and say, hey, we, we got to do away with this. We can't embrace this. Now, I, I would say, can you give us like three examples of power-hungry tyrants that use this? So I, these would be Christian husbands, okay, because we're talking about Christian marriage, Christian husbands. Give me three examples of power-hungry tyrants who have used this verse to subjugate their wife. I couldn't name you one, right? Now, I'm 41 years old. I can't think of a single Christian husband 
who took this verse and subjugated his wife and his wife actually fell in line and submitted to her husband. Like, I can't name you three wives I know that submit to their husbands, let alone submit to a tyrant. Like, I just, I just wonder how out of touch sometimes we are with this, like, oh, we got all these, I like, okay, a Christian husband who uses this and his wife actually submits to a tyrant. I don't know a single person. If he could give me three, that'd be awesome. I've never seen one before. This is like Bigfoot. It's like you hear about them, but you never seen them. I can name you wives all over the place that don't submit to their husbands. I that's what I'm I can't I can't even think of three that submit to their husbands and everything that follow this command the best they can. Can't think of three. But we got them everywhere, I guess. I guess, you know. I mean, look at all the examples of where this has gone wrong. And I will agree with you. There have been plenty of examples where this has gone wrong. What Name a few of these examples. I'd like to hear some of a Christian husband where his wife was submitting to him and everything. To a tyrant. She was submitting to a tyrant. I don't know Christian women who submit to good husbands, cr good Christian husbands. I don't know them, let alone the tyrants. Here's a question. Does the fact that some have gotten this really wrong mean we throw out God's instruction? So Pastor John is going to go on to make an analogy about Beethoven writing the Fleur de Lis and him playing it or listening to the actual and then he plays it and he doesn't play it very well. And so making the analogy, here's, here's where he's going to go into that analogy that he makes uh, in the sermon. Here's my question. Should we base, another way of saying this is, should we base the quality of what Beethoven composed should what Beethoven be what he composed be based on my performance, the quality of it? In other words, should we throw out a beautiful composition because of a poor delivery on my part? I think we would all say no. Just because your performance was bad, John, doesn't mean that his composition was not beautiful. Same way with this passage. What God has composed here in his word is perfection. And just because we have seen a bad delivery or a bad performance from time to time, doesn't mean that we throw out God's instruction. The answer isn't throwing out the scripture. It's actually calling men to play at a higher level and loving like Christ, which Paul will go on to do. Oh, yes, yes. Men, you must man up and do better. Here's, what, here's what's implicit here. Men, the reason why your wife doesn't want to submit to you, the reason why everybody cringes when they hear this passage is because you're not good enough. You don't lead well enough. You don't love far enough. You don't swim the ocean deeper, higher, whatever. You know the song, whatever. I would swim the deepest ocean for you, baby, whatever. Blah, blah, blah. I give you the moon. You don't do it enough. And if you would just step up and do it, then your wife would see the beauty of God's composition in scripture and the command to submit to your husband in everything. Wrong. That is wrong. Here, here's why I'll tell you why that's wrong. We're going to go back. This, the scripture tells us that's wrong. That, well, if you just do it better, then she'd want to submit. That's wrong. Here's why it's wrong. Genesis chapter three. The woman is deceived. She eats the fruit. <clears throat> she receives the curse. And so does the man because the man eats the fruit as well. And God says, because you listen to your wife, I'm going to give you a curse. Ooh, that's a tough one. All right. Genesis chapter three, though. What is part of the woman's curse? Her desire will be for you, and you will have to rule over her. What does that mean? That means that she will desire your position as head. She will not want to submit to it. So part of a woman's curse is not wanting to submit to her husband. And that is why. When I teach this passage through Ephesians chapter 5, we start with Ephesians 5.18, which is the command to not be drunk with wine, but to be filled with the Spirit. And as we are filled with the Holy Spirit, there are things that will happen. Verse 21, we'll submit to one another. That's in the church, right? We're submitting to one another. That's not in the home. That's in the church. We submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then we see it in the marriage relationship. The wives will submit to their husbands, and the husbands will love them, love their wives with agape love. 
Okay. Those are supernatural workings of the spirit because a woman will not want to ever submit to her husband. And a husband will not want to love his wife with agape love that's empowered by the Holy Spirit. Let's go on. Now, because the idea of submitting has so much baggage with it, let's talk about what it doesn't mean. Okay, there's another pastor I follow. Wait a minute. Wait a minute now. <laughs> I was looking for what it does mean. It says submit in everything. So tell me what that means then. What does it mean Pastor John, to submit in everything. I don't I don't think I got that yet, but we're going to go to what it doesn't mean. Okay, now, Pastor John, he's not alone. Every pastor does this when they talk about. Now, I give him kudos. He spent like, in his sermon, he spent like 15 minutes talking about submission. I couldn't believe it. I was like, I need to go to this guy's church. 15 minutes he spent talking about submission. I couldn't believe it. Couldn't believe he even said the word, actually, in 2024. I couldn't believe the word was even spoken in the church. All pastors, though, they're going to go to, first off, what submission doesn't mean, okay? Always. That's what they always do. This is a classic presentation of submission, and I'm glad it's actually still being given. At least we at least we try to give it even today. I can't believe we're actually still doing it, but here we go. list that I found very helpful. Okay, submission does not mean the inferiority of the women. So Paul's not saying that the women are to submit, wives are to submit because they're inferior or less than. In fact, the Bible tells us that Jesus submitted himself to the Father. But that doesn't mean Jesus was inferior to God the Father. Men and women are created equal in dignity, value, and worth, and both have been gifted to spiritually serve the Lord and each other. Not one is better than the other. They partner together. Submission all... Inferior is the wrong word. Subordinate is a good word to use there. Submission is a military term. We see, like, the best place to see submission laid out is in the military where you have superiors and you have subordinates and the subordinates are in submission to the superiors. They have to follow orders or else order will break down and chaos will ensue. And that's what we have in our houses and in our marriages, mostly because nobody knows the order of how things are to operate. Who's the superior and who's the subordinate? Who's the captain and who's the first mate? I really like that. I like that analogy. You got the captain and the first mate. That's a great analogy for biblical submission. Inferior is not a very good term, though. I don't think anybody's saying that as far as inferior. But I will say to note, the average husband, he's superior in strength. He's stronger than his wife. The average husband has more confidence than his wife. The average husband has more money than his wife, or else she wouldn't have married him. The average husband is taller than his wife, right? So if we're going to, any any real measure of superiority, the husband's probably going to have over the wife, but we can't mention those things or else we'll get tossed out, right? Also does not mean the unconditional obedience of the wife. When the verse says, submit yourself to your own husband as you do the Lord, it doesn't mean submit yourself as to your husband, to your husband as if he is the Lord, but it means in submitting to him, you are serving the Lord. But listen, if your husband's trying to get you to do something that would cause you to disobey the Lord, you're... Here's the classic one here. You don't just obey him blindly. Okay, the verse does say submit to your husband in everything. Now, your husband is responsible partly for you, right? So if he tells you to do something wrong, now obviously if it's blatantly wrong, okay, don't submit. And he says it's not like he's the Lord. Oh, good point. Now, what does 1 Peter... 1 Peter has something to say about that. 1 Peter says, wives, 1 Peter chapter 3 says, wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands. If you read on, it talks about Sarah, who, for this is the way the holy women of the past put their hope in God, used to make themselves beautiful. They were submissive to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her master. Some translations say, Lord. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Meaning, you should be like Sarah, who called Abraham her Lord or her master, and she submitted to him. That kind of, in a way, contradicts what Pastor John is saying here. This is the word of God. Let's go on in the list. You're not, you're not obligated in any way. He says, let's do illicit drugs, or you know, let's watch porn together, or cheat on your taxes. No. Submit to that. What husband is saying, let's do illicit drugs together? Is there any husband saying this? I've never met a husband that said that to his wife. 
Submission also does not mean the dominance of the man. Submission doesn't mean wives are to be a doormat and their husbands get to walk all over them as if somehow wives just exist to be a servant in the house and just cater to their husbands every whim. So here's what it does mean. I want to give you a few words. Now, who's doing that too? I've never met these wives that when they're trying to be submissive, they just are a doormat and they just cater to their husbands every whim. I don't, I haven't ever met these wives before. Has anybody, hey, give me a comment below. Has anybody met these wives that, that do this? I haven't met one yet. And I think the reason is because part of a woman's curse is that she will not want to submit to her husband. It's not because he's not a good enough leader. It's not because he doesn't love her enough. It's because it's part of her curse and the fall of man. Well, we'll stop the video there. We'll do part two on what submission actually does mean. It's a good list. Pastor John, man, I like this guy. I like, that was that was awesome when he started that. He's just like, oh, you know, he knows he, knows he might get blown away up there if he, uh, if he preaches too hard on this. And my hat's off to him for doing it. I mean, 15 minutes almost talking about submission is ridiculous in 2024. I can't believe he had the stones to even do it. And the other thing I know, we got to say it, is that Christ is winning. He is building his church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Until next time, this is the Post-Millennial Man.